Hi, Jai Hind, and welcome everyone. Thank you for you joining the virtual wine training session. My name is Vina Punia, and I'm assistant professor at Bikaji Kama Subharti College of Hotel Management, and I will be the moderator for today's session. The training session will benefit the budding professional of hospitality industry. It will enhance your wine knowledge also. To enlighten this topic, we have a renowned personality, Mr. Rakesh, who is familiar with Fertility Wine. It is India's largest single estate owned vineyards. Mr. Rakesh was and raised in Mumbai and began his learning of journey as a graduate of business administration from London. He is a certified sommelier by the court of master sommeliers as well as a wine spirit education trust level four diploma candidate. Currently pursuing his advanced sommelier with the intent to teach and perhaps pursue a master sommelier designation. Professionally, Rakesh has been involved in all aspects of wine management, from training to tasting. He has created full wine and beverage programs, worked as a sommelier, taught wine education, as well as helped many wine bars and restaurants. Rakesh has worked for Oberoi's India, One Michelin Star, Launceston Palace, Cinema Club, Gordon Ramsay's Savoy Grill in London. Rakesh flourishes when he is connecting with people and drinking obscure indigenous wines. Rakesh was voted as the best sommelier in Delhi NCR in 2019. He was only ambassador for the Champagne Crook in India, a part of LVMH, Moe Hennessy, Louis Vuitton, and also the brand ambassador of Bergner Europe, Cook and Chef Institute, who promote technological innovation in kitchenware. He hosted the Fine Wine Affair, three extra venture event featuring renowned wine with a series of wine tasting experience, education inputs, and curated master classes. He was a tutor of WSET Level 2 at Oberoi's Center of Learning and Development, that is OCLD. For academic excellence, he has participated in articles on wines, specialist magazines like Sumilar India, Brews and Spirit, Delhi Wine Club, etc. He is currently one of the 10 mentors for the Vinica Agri Diversity Program in British Columbia, Canada. His philosophy remains the place collaboration in individual based on wine is better judged without a context. It is a completely human experience, not an intangible thing, and should be fun on every single day. We welcome him on behalf of BCSC team, Vikaji Kama Subharti College of Hotel Management team. Moving forward, the host of the webinar is our very own Professor Dr. Shiv Mohan Verma, Principal of Vikaji Kama Subharti College of Hotel Management. I request our principal, sir, welcome the speaker and all the attendees. Jai Hind, uh, Jai Hind everyone. It is my immense pleasure to welcome Mr. Rakesh Somelier with Fatley and all the academicians, industry experts, and my dear students from across the globe. The purpose of this uh, training session to gain knowledge about the wines so that the uh, so that experienced uh, professionals get benefited through this uh, training session. Thank you and over to Mr. Vinay. Thank you, sir. Now, without further ado, we'll turn over to our trainer. Sir, I request you to proceed with the topic. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to start sharing the screen uh, once again. Right. Uh, I hope everyone can see the screen now. Yes, sir. Good. All right. So uh, thank you for my introduction, uh, Vinay. And uh, I think, uh, it's going to be a really fun and exciting session. So uh, like Vinay said, so I'm currently in my role of uh, Somalia and I'm uh, looking after Fratelli wines. So I spent about uh, four months, not not so old enough. I'm still young in the company, but uh, it's the first time for me working uh, for, for a wine producer in India. So uh, there are a lot of new and exciting things we have planned, uh, even for the students. Uh, like you may have questions if you do like to visit the winery, the vineyards. So yes, we are planning that as well. And we are also planning to get some more internships uh, for, for students who would like to specialize in the wines. Uh, if you do like to spend some time in the vineyards and understand uh, the subject in a, in a much 
better in a practical way yes that would be welcome as well from the next year harvest so yes we will be uh, working on, on on that platform as well uh, coming back uh, to the today's session we're going to uh, divide the session into two parts we're going to talk uh, the first one is about our company uh, a slightly bit more about our background of the company and the philosophy uh, the special wines which we are doing and and some new concepts which we have introduced a uh, second part is going to be more about your educational background uh, the, the different methods of the sparkling wines uh, the white and the red uh, how they are produced uh, the grape varieties we're going to talk about them uh, and then we're going to talk about the, the food and the wine pairing uh, the art of tasting wines uh, and we're also going to talk about something special is like your educational uh, the few further educations uh, into the into the wines and then what are the careers for prospects which you can look into uh, in, the, in the wine industry so, the, so that uh, it's a lot of things uh, we would like to uh, we don't want to waste a lot of time so we like to straight away go on to the sessions uh, and we'll start uh, about the introduction about the fertility so fertility is India's single largest estate grown producer we've been uh, growing wines on our own vineyards and which rightly allows us to produce uh, wines of great quality and uh, and flavor. So uh, the company was established in 2007 and there were three partners, three families. They came together and that's how the company uh, came into existence. So we have three partners, the three brothers. We have the Seki. The Seki brothers are your Andrea and Alicio. We have from Italy, we have the Sekri brothers. They are the Kapil and Gaurav from Delhi. And we have the Mohite Patil brothers, which are your Ranjit and Arjun Singh from Solapu. The, the, the word itself means brothers in the, in the Italian language. Right, uh, so the brand is a premium Indian brand and we've been steadily gaining recognition for its quality and setting a new benchmark worldwide. So our vineyards are, are placed uh, in Akluj. Akluj is a really small, a really tiny village in Solapur. It's located southwest of Maharashtra. We have, we have a nice slopes uh, into our vineyards and that's the reason why we have selected Akluj. A slope is really important, especially uh, when you want to have uh, the influence of the height. So when you go up onto the slopes, you get a temperature decrease of about a few degrees. So every 50 meters rise in the temperatures, you get a temperature decrease of one degree Celsius. And Akluj is, uh, is slightly, the village is slightly higher on the grounds, from the ground. Uh, so most of the vineyards we, when we have planted the grapes have a slight elevation. So we enjoy uh, a much lower temperature. Uh, that is the influence of the slopes onto our vineyards, uh, which allows us to produce wines with great amount of acidity and freshness. Uh, that is one of the reasons why we have we are in Akluj, and secondly, because there is no industrial area, there is no factory settings at all. In about 50 kilometer of radius, where we are located, there is no pollution, and because there is no pollution, it is really important and vital for the, for the development and the growth of the grapes, uh, which you can see in many of our wines. Right. So uh, we planted about 350,000 saplings. Saplings are nothing but your young wines, which we imported from France, uh, from Burgundy, which is a very famous region. Uh, from there, we have uh, a grape wine nursery by the name of Guyenne. We imported 12 different species, 12 different varieties like Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon, Shiraz, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. We have a direct control of 240 acres of the land which belongs to us. And that's the reason why we rightly say ourselves as India's single largest estate grown producer. Uh, we also do a contract farming of about 300 acres with the local growers and producers. Our vineyards were planted on virgin land. We created a new region in Akluj, which continues to expand. The harvest in India in Akluj is usually happens in February and March. Those are the crucial months of the harvest. Uh, we do 100% of manual labor. We don't employ machine harvesting. And when you do a manual labor, uh, we do a selection process, which is uh, very lengthy and uh, tedious. So only the ripest grapes get selected into our uh, production. The grapes which are still underripe, they need to spend some more extra time into the vineyards so that they achieve the ripeness levels. Once they achieve that, then they get picked up. So this is a continuous ongoing process. And hence, we start the process somewhere early January and then finishes off 
till the end of March. So the three months gives us, uh, gives us a, a good extended period of picking the grapes at the at the right uh, ripeness levels. So that's how the harvest in India happens, uh, in, uh, in Akluj happens. So these are the four regions uh, primarily responsible for, for producing wines in India. So you have the Solapur, which is slightly inland, away from the coast, but we have the influence of the slopes. Nashik and the Pune, they are towards the coast and hence they, they get a more moderate temperature because of the sea. Uh, Karnataka is towards the southern part of the, the border uh, of Maharashtra. There also you will find some vineyards as well. So winery is a place, uh, is an estate, uh, it's a production house or, or a, it's a factory where the, where the wines are being produced. So the grapes are bought to the wineries and then uh, eventually the wine is being uh, made over here. So uh, a winery is spread out on the 70,000 square feet of the area. It's a quite wide, spacious and a state of the art uh, area where we have built up. Uh, it is one of the, it is situated in Motivadi, which is one of the, the key vineyard sites of the company. And we have uh, installed capacity of about 2 million liters. All the equipment we have imported from Bello, which is a region in northwestern part of Italy. The distance between the winery and the vineyard is quite less because when you pick up the grapes during the harvest in March, the grapes are very delicate and fragile. These grapes need to be uh, transferred at the earliest uh, into your estates because uh, if the grapes have been left in the sun for too long, they might split up, they might, uh, the juice might start to come out and all the essential nutrients and the elements which are required to produce a quality wine will wash away. So that to maintain that and, and we have to ensure that this does not happen, we transfer the grapes within 60 minutes of the harvest into our vineyards. So this is the man responsible for the way our wine tastes. Uh, the way uh, we, we decide our blending uh, and also uh, the time we can do the harvest. So Piero Masi, uh, it's a great personality, a very renowned name across the world for his Tuscan wines. He also produces a wine in Tuscany by the name of Casasola, which is in the Chianti Classico. And the Classico is in Tuscany and Tuscany is the central part of Italy. Piero has an experience of more than 40 years and 64 harvest besides technical expertise Piero is also has a stake in our company. So coming back to, uh, to the subject of the topics which you have covered in, in, your, uh, uh, in your three years of program. So we're going to talk about the sparkling wines first. So sparkling wines, the grapes are picked up, they're harvested, uh, and then they've been bought into the estates. When the grapes are bought into the estates, uh, we, need to, we need to press the grapes. So when we press the grapes, the juice is collected and we start a fermentation. Fermentation begins when uh, yeast has been added into the tank, the fermentation starts and we produce a wine uh, with, with some low alcohol. Now this wine has been then collected and transferred into, a, into a, a big thick bottles where we also add the wine and a liquor de tirage. Liquor de tirage is a French word which means a mixture of sugar and yeast. Sugar and yeast has been added to start uh, or to aggregate the second fermentation which is now going to happen into the bottle, right? So mixture has been added and we uh, use a closure of a, a metal uh, a screw cap or a metal crown cap. That is the metal crown cap has been placed just to make sure that nothing escapes uh, from the bottle. The bottles are then being laid horizontally into the cellars, in the deep dark cellars, and it has been rested for about a month or two months. Where the second fermentation starts, the sugar feeds, the, sorry, the yeast feeds on the sugar and it starts to convert uh, alcohol and CO2. The alcohol and CO2 has nowhere to escape, so they get stuck in the bottle. Uh, the CO2 integrates with the wine and that's how you produce, uh, you have this carbon dioxide in a bottle of wine when you, when you open the bottle. Alcohol also gets added to already low alcoholic wine and that's how you get about 12 to 13% of alcohol. Now, when all the sugar has been converted, the dead yeast cells has, has nothing else to survive on, and hence the dead yeast cells gets uh, has to die. So the uh, so the yeast cells dies, and now they become a dead yeast cells. Now the dead yeast cells needs to be removed from the bottle. So what we do is we start a process of riddling. So riddling is a process where uh, you need to remove 
uh, or you to you to uh, collect the dead yeast cells at the neck of the bottle. So we turn the bottle anti-clockwise direction. Uh, that is called as drilling. And 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 once we do that, all the, the sediments they get collected at the neck. Once they have been collected at the neck, then we have to dip that uh, that neck of the bottle into a brine solution where the entire neck gets frozen. Now we need to remove that that brine. We need to remove that sediments. Uh, so we use uh, uh, we with the pressure from the gas which is inside the bottle. Uh, when you remove the the, the crown cap, uh, the, the solid thing just flies out like a popsicle uh, with the pressure from inside the gas. And with that, we also lose some amount of uh, wine as well. Now, uh, to replace that, we add a reserve wine or a special wine uh, and for the loss. And then we put it back. And at the same time, we also add a sugar. Now, sugar has been added at this stage to define what will be the style of the wine. If it's a brute wine, then there will be about 6 grams of sugar per liter. If it is a, a slightly off dry, well, then we can add more sugar. And if you want to make a demi sec, sec or a douze style of wine, which is a different terms which have been used uh, as per the amount of sugar which increases, you can have different levels. So that has been done, and and then the bottles have been corked, uh, wire mesh has been uh, taped around, and the bottles have been labeled, and this then the bottles have been sold into the market. So that, that's how you get a more or less uh, sparkling wines they've been produced. White wines, uh, you pick up the grapes, you bring them to the estates, you do a press. When we do the press, uh, you collect the juice. The juice has been collected and then it has been sent to a tank. In a tank, we do a settling. So settling is uh, when all the solid particles need to be uh, settled down and the juice has then been transferred. So all the solid particles settle down, the juice has been transferred to a different tank where we add the yeast. Yeast has been added and we start a second, we start the fermentation uh, in about seven to ten days afterwards, you get your uh, you get your wine ready. Now, when the wine is ready, uh, the wine needs to be blended. If the wine has been made from different grape varieties, then uh, the different grape varieties have been blended in according to the proportion. Or if a grape variety has been uh, sourced from different vineyards or different parcels of the land, then accordingly the proportion has been created and the wines have been blended. Once the wines have been blended, then uh, they are been sent to a clarification tank. A clarification tank is is uh, is where the wines needs to be filtered. So the filtration is a process where the wines have been sent to a different membranes, uh, different membranes, so that all the final sediments which you cannot see from your naked eye gets collected, and and that's how the wines uh, are, are been clear. Once the uh, once the clarification happens, then the wines are straight away bottle and it has been then sent to the market. So that's how more or less your white wines have been made. You also have two different uh, uh, optional uh, fermentations or methods which are applicable in white wines are your malolactic and your stirring of the lease. This is not so common and this is sometimes been used by some wine producers. Malolactic fermentation has been usually carried out for certain grape varieties like Chardonnay and Bionier. So Chardonnay and Bionier may, may often sometimes have malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation is the conversion of malic acid to lactic acid. Malic acid is the one which you find a lot in your green apples. So think about how the green apple tastes like. So that needs to be converted into lactic acid. Lactic acid is the one which you find in many of your dairy products, your milk, cream and cheese, uh, your yogurt the butter. Uh, so those are the those are the flavors, those are the, the characteristics uh, which needs to be converted. So the conversion of uh, uh, conversion of green apple to dairy is what we think about when we do the malolactic fermentation. Right. So this is usually been done with Chardonnay and Bionier. It's an optional process in white wines. Stirring of the leaves is the same way like uh, how we do in a sparkling wine second fermentation when the dead yeast cells die uh, the dead yeast cells interact with the wine and that's how they provide a slightly more uh, of flavor and aroma characteristics so uh, exactly the same way stirring of the bees happens with with the 
uh, with, the, with the white wines as well. So we do the same uh, principles where the wine gets uh, gets interacted with the dead yeast cells, and we provide uh, a slightly more uh, more biscuity, a more yeastiness, and more toasty, a fermented dough kind of flavor. Now this is usually happens to some of the white wines, uh, which which the winemaker wants to impart those kind of flavor. That's the study of the list. So these two methods are optional and does not usually happen in the white wines, but generally uh, this is how white wines are being made. Secondly, now we come back to the red wines. So we pick up the grapes, uh, you, you prepare them for the harvest, uh, you bring them to the to the winery. When you bring them to the winery, you straight away add the yeast. Yeast has been added, fermentation starts in about seven to 10 days, you get this beautiful red wine, which is ready. Now here, the red wine, the, the purpose of getting the color and the tannins from the skins. So the skins is part of the fermentation. Now you have got a maximum extraction of the color from the skins, and you also have got a high amount of tannins and the flavors from the skins as well. Now you remove, you need to separate the skins from the, from the tank. So we separate the skins, the skins has been separated and uh, this can be uh, acted as, as, a, as, a, as a fodder for the cattle or it can be used as a nutrition for the, for the soil, right? So the wine has now been collected and it needs to be passed through a malolactic fermentation. So we call it as an MLF, which is a malolactic fermentation. Uh, it's a necessary, it's a 100% a mandatory process for all the red wines to pass through malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation has been passed and the wines are then being aged. So as per uh, the requirements of, of particular countries, the wines have been aged for about three months, six months, or a year or two years. Depending on the law of the country, the wines have been aged in the barrels. After that, they have been blended. So blending is simply uh, the same way as we do in the white wines. If the wines have been made from different grape varieties, at this stage, the winemaker decides the blend and the proportion of the grapes to be blended. And also if the wine is made from a single grape variety, but if it's made, if it's been picked up from different parcels of the land, different plots of the land, then that is again being uh, proportionated accordingly and the blend is being created. Blending has been done at this stage and exactly as the white wine, the wines needs to follow with the clarification and bottling. So clarification is again been done uh, uh, to, to filter the wines. So wine still has a lot of finer sediments, which you cannot see from your naked eyes. Those sediments gets gets filtered and then straight away the wines have been bottled. Once the wines have been bottled, uh, after that they need to be aged. Again, uh, the same way as the aging, uh, there are certain laws in some, in some regions where they, 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 they ask you to age the wines for a certain amount of time. So the wine needs to be aged further in the bottles and after the, after the aging of the bottles, the wines are then being dispatched into the, the market. So that's how more or less your red wines are being produced uh, and, and it's really important to understand uh, uh, in red wines that the, the two more important steps is the aging in the, in the barrels and the aging in the, in the bottles which quite usually does not happen in many of the white wines. Right, so now we're going to talk about the general classification of the wines. Like we all know wines have been classified, uh, wines have been classified as uh, as still sparkling and sweet that's by the type uh, the body which can be a light body a medium and a full and a heavy body points by the level of sweetness uh, example wine like we did in the, in the sparkling wines we have at the, at the end we had a dosage where the wines were been added with an amount of sugar so now the amount of sugar you add also gives you different styles of the wine so exactly same way we have here the dry off dry medium sweet and a sweet so those the wines can also be been classified by the level of sweetness in the, in the wines, right? So we're going to talk about in generally about the wines, about how Cabernet Sauvignon. Sorry, how Cabernet Sauvignon is being produced, is being produced uh, in, in, in India, right? So Cabernet Sauvignon has a thick skin. Uh, because of the thick skin, it also gives you a lot of bitterness and uh, it produces wines of a lot of tannins. Uh, and a lot of heaviness. So uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, when you smell or when you taste a wine uh, which is a base of Cabernet Sauvignon, it will give you a lot of those black fruits. You will get your black currant and your black cherries. Along with that, you may also have some 
some fresh mint and some herbaceous characteristics like your bell peppers and your capsicums. So those vegetable flavors, it's a mix of those vegetable flavors and a, and a mix of the black fruits is what you will find a lot more pronounced, especially when a Cabernet Sauvignon is being produced in a hot country like India. So that is what you should expect uh, when you smell or when you taste uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, because Cabernet Sauvignon is also gives you a lot of those uh, uh, highly flavored uh, wines, highly concentrated and, and highly intensified wines, you should look at pairing with food dishes which has similar kind of intensity, similar kind of flavors and similar kind of concentrations. So I, I, I most closely associate those foods like which have been slow cooked, uh, the, where the flavors have been accumulated and, and you, you really get a lot of concentrated and intensified dishes. Your lamb shanks, uh, your, many of your casseroles or, or your confit dishes, your duck confit, uh, your, your shepherd's pie or your lasagnas. Those are the dishes which has a lot of meatiness, uh, which balances the weight and they also have a lot of flavor and concentration, which is equally uh, important in the Cabernet Sauvignon based wines. So you, we, are, we are matching uh, the weight uh, and, the, and, the, and the concentration of the, of the wine with something similar weight and concentration in the, in the food. So that's how uh, uh, it's a great pairing to match with <clears throat> those certain kind of dishes. Next is your Sangiovese, a grape which is a native to Tuscany, responsible for many of the famous wines like Chianti. Now Chianti is a world renowned wine. The grape responsible is 100% Sangiovese. But Sangiovese is more like a chameleon. It changes its color and its flavor wherever it has been produced. In, 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 in Tuscany itself, it produces wines of different spectrum. You get a light, you get a medium, and you get a full body wine. When it travels to India in approach into our soils, we get, we get a slightly lighter style of wine in infertility Sangiovese. This wine is a lot about primary red fruit characteristics. So you're getting a lot of your red cherries and your plums. Along with that, you also get some subtle hint of tomatoes. You know? That's what uh, our fertility Sangiovese is all about. A great replacement even for your Pinot Noirs or for your lighter style of wines. A great replacement even for many of your Chiantis, uh, which have been uh, imported into the India. So uh, this is a really good product which is made in India. So uh, when you're thinking of, of pairing this Fratelli Sangiovese, I think this wine is great as an aperitif. You can simply drink a glass of wine. If you are a beginner and you just want to explore the world of wines and you want to start your journey, I think you should begin from Fratelli Sangiovese. Or if you do want to pair, uh, think about those, those dishes which has a lot of tomatoes or, or, or a lot of those uh, acidic foods with that. Uh, this wine has slightly more acidic uh, acidity and slightly less bitterness. Uh, but uh, like I said, the tomato is something which complements the wine itself. Uh, you can also look at uh, dishes which has tomatoes. So you're actually complementing the flavor in the wine and the flavor in the food together really, really well. Second thing uh, you can also think about is when you're doing a regional pairing. When, like you all know, the pizzas and, and the pastas, they have a uh, uh, tradition of, of Italian food. Now, a grape which itself is native to Tuscany, uh, you can think about a regional pairing, where you're pairing a wine of that country, obviously produced in India, with uh, pizza and the pastas, which had originated from Italy, obviously produced in India. So that is also one of the regional pairing you can think about when you're looking uh, at pairing with Fratelli Sangiovese as well. Right, so uh, that's the Sangiovese. Next is the Merlot. Merlot for me, it's a, when it's produced in India it's, or in anywhere in the world, uh, it's a crowd pleasing wine. It's a, it's a wine which wins many of the hearts. Simply because Merlot is it's a medium bodied wine and it gives you a lot of those lush breadfruit flavors. Think about your ripe red cherries and your ripe uh, red plums, uh, along with that overripe jam and the marmalades, which you sometimes use uh, morning breakfast for the toast. You know, that, that gives you that hint of the sweetness, which has been uh, provided really well by the Merlot. That is the reason why Merlot works really well on the Indian palates. Uh, it has been loved by many Indian consumers, simply because it adds that, that touch of sweetness uh, in the wine, uh, which, is, which gets balanced really well with many of your hot and your, uh, your spicier dishes. So that, that balance is really creates uh, a harmony 
uh, your spiciness or your hotness in the food comes down and your wine gets absolutely dry. So that's how the Merlot has been successful uh, with many Indian foods as well. Or even if you just, you have a, you like slightly a sweeter style of the wines, a hint of sweetness, then you can even try the Merlot on its own. Uh, simply, if you don't need any food, you can just have a glass of Merlot and it's a, it's a great wine uh, to start your evening as well. So that's that's how I, I, I define Merlot. It's a medium bodied wine. It's not too light like a Sangiovese or it's not too fuller uh, like a Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a, it's a perfectly a well balanced uh, fruits and a beautiful, supple, rich wine. Uh, next is our Shiraz. Shiraz is something similar to your Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a rich, heavy and a powerful, a full bodied wine. The grape itself has a thick skin like a Shiraz and because of the thick skin, you produce a, a wine with a lot of color, a lot of tannins as well, a lot of alcohol too. Uh, that, it, that it comes naturally and that is the reason why Shiraz also uh, gets quite powerful and, and heavy as well. Now when you, when you do this, uh, when you think about Shiraz, when you smell or when you taste, uh, you're, looking at, you're looking at the black fruits again. Now, but think about the black plums, something like your jamun, which is, uh, which is right now is the season for the jamun. You can just pick up those handful of jamuns and, and try eat them and understand how the jamun tastes. This is exactly what, what reminds us of when we, when we think about Shiraz. Along with that jamun, you will also get some, uh, some spices, uh, your pronounced black pepper and also your, your hints of cinnamon and cloves. Now the spices is really well associated surrounding the Shiraz. So uh, this is again one of the popular wines which works well under the Indian palate because we love the spices in the food. So do we love the spices in our wine and this wine uh, goes really well. It complements uh, when you have some spicy, some whole spices in your, in your cuisines. This works really, really well. The complement, uh, it creates a beautiful pairing as well. So, so that's how Shiraz has been again a really, really popular in India. It loves the heat, it loves the, our weather and it produces some really excellent a top quality wines as well, right? So uh, coming back to our whites, Sauvignon Blanc, the grape itself uh, means a wild white. Sauvignon means wild, this grape uh, grows widely into any uh, any climate. Uh, anywhere around the world, Sauvignon Blanc is one of the, uh, the best grown variety. It, without any much effort, this grape grows. Something similar like the grass, it, it grows wildly. Uh, this is this is one of the most uh, lightest and the most aromatic grape you can ever come across. So uh, it gives you a lot of those refreshing acidity uh, and a very sharp and a, and a tart uh, feeling as well. Refreshing acidity is something when you have a fresh lime juice, you get the aftertaste, you get that sourness. It's exactly what is given by Sauvignon Blanc. And, and, and because of uh, the green citrus fruits, the gooseberry, the amla, and the grapefruit. This is what you will find a lot in Sauvignon Blanc. So associate Sauvignon Blanc with, with green fruits, your green apple, your gooseberry, which is the amla, your, your grapefruit. Also, you want to understand uh, more in detail about Sauvignon Blanc. Try picking up those fresh grass outside on your lawn. Pick up those fresh grass, rub onto your palms, and smell the, the aromatics of those grass. This is exactly what Sauvignon Blanc smells like. So uh, it's, it's a lot of those fresh, green, grassy flavors as well. Uh, it has those ripe and, and sharp, tart acidity as well. Uh, it gives you that feeling of the sourness as well. Uh, that is the reason why many people in India don't prefer or don't like Sauvignon Blanc. Maybe because they have not developed the taste yet for Sauvignon Blanc. But this is one of the greatest wine you can pair with the food. It's really, really versatile uh, uh, and, and uh, different foods a different uh, buffet food or you have a bigger table and they have just requested for one white wine then this is the best option you can uh, explore so many long would be a versatile wine because of the high acidity it can pair with many different foods so that's that's the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Chenin Blanc uh, one of the grape which is not so well known in the world but certainly in India this grape has taken up uh, a center stage uh, one of the most popular grape simply because a few reasons. This grape loves the heat, it loves the sunshine in which, uh, in which it is produced in India. Uh, because of that, it gives you a good volume, a good production. A good yield has been really associated and because of that, the impact on the wine is, is quite affordable. 
you get some really good examples, some excellent quality wines at an economically priced uh, bracket. That's what Chenin Blanc is all about. When you taste or when you smell Chenin Blanc, think about those, those subtle uh, stone or the white fruits, your peach, your pear, and your apricots. Uh, those, those are the white fruits where you have those big seeds uh, in the fruits. So these are the, the fruits which you will find a lot from Chenin Blanc. Also some subtle hints of melon and some honey as well. Honey is being associated uh, with Chenin Blanc across the world. It provides you that hint of sweetness, which is critically important when you want to pair with some spicy, some hot dishes uh, in India. And as you know, in everyone's uh, home, when we cook uh, some other, other day, we do have many of the dishes which are hot. This one is not as, as expensive. It's actually quite affordable. You can even pick up a half bottle of a Chenin Blanc and you can create that experience immediately in your home. So you can, you can, you can understand how Chenin Blanc, Chenin Blanc reacts to this hot and spicy food. So that's, that's the, the Chenin Blanc. Uh, and in fact, Chenin Blanc has been produced uh, across many different styles, simply because the grape has been uh, produced in, in good qualities, in good quantities and qualities. So you have your sparkling wine, which can be sometimes 100% Chenin Blanc, or it can be a dominant grape variety. Many of your white wines are 100% Chenin Blanc. And you also get your sweet wines, uh, which is somewhat like your late harvest Chenin Blancs, which are also some really great examples you want to explore uh, from India. So those are the different uh, spectrums you can identify Chenin Blanc being produced in India. And simply because this grape has been, has been producing excellent results, we have, uh, we have now making so many different styles. Next, we have the Chardonnay, uh, a grape which is not as aromatic as Sauvignon Blanc. And in fact, this grape is slightly more fuller compared to, compared to Sauvignon Blanc. It gives you a slightly more uh, heavier styles. And this grape, in fact, loves uh, a bit of oak as well. So if you do want to, uh, uh, if, you do want, if you do have some examples which have oak egg Chardonnay, then there are some really excellent results. Chardonnay, when it's produced in India, it gives you those, a lot of tropical notes. Uh, tropical notes or, or tropical fruit flavors, which you find abundantly in the Chardonnay. So think about your pineapple, mango, your kiwi, and your banana. So these tropical fruits, which comes quite easily, you can find in Chardonnay. Along with that, coming back to our white wine production, when I, when I spoke about the malolactic fermentation. So the dairiness, the dairy effect, or the flavors of the dairy, which is your, your butter, uh, cream, and milk, uh, those are the flavors you will find a lot in Chardonnay as well. So uh, along with that, along with the fruity notes, you're looking at the butter, uh, the cream, uh, the dairy, the milk. So those are the notes you will find complementing in Chardonnay. And hence, when you're looking at pairing, think about those sauces which are based out of dairy. Uh, think about those rich gravy or the cashew nuts gravy, which, which can pair really well with Chardonnay. A lot of your white sauces and even your your chicken malai tikka or your butter chicken can work really well with chardonnay. And, uh, and also your fishes and your seafoods, when they've been tossed and when they've been cooked in, in, a, in a, when they've been tossed in butter or they've been cooked in, in light sauces of, of white uh, uh, dairy, then those can be an excellent pairing uh, to, to do with chardonnay. So, so that's, that's something you should think about when you're looking at chardonnay, when you're looking at those white sauces or those white meats, which can be a beautiful pairing. Right, so we have two examples of the sparkling wines, which, which uh, we would like to share with you. The first one is our serious, full-bodied, and extraordinary uh, depth of aging uh, called JCP number 47. Now this wine is 100% Chardonnay, a vintage dated, uh, which is unusual in India. Uh, first of all, we thought it's very rare to use 100% Chardonnay. And secondly, uh, many of the sparklings are not made in vintage, they are made uh, a blend of different vintages, we call it non-vintage. Now this is a standout wine uh, right from the first beginning uh, of the two USPs. Secondly, uh, this has also been made of, uh, the, the aging in this one is about barren. So six months, the first fermentation, which we usually do in stainless steel tanks, here we do it barrel. So we use about six months of barrel fermentation and aging, and then 30 months of second fermentation in the bottle. So this wine spends about 36 months equivalent in three years in the, in the deep cellars uh, without seeing any daylight. After the three years of cellar aging, then the wines have been uh, 
uh, sent out, it has been sent into the market. Some extraordinary aging for these wines, which is for the first time any sparkling wine has been got with such of aging. Uh, the, simply this wine has been uh, made in a, in a style and in a manner which you would like to compete with many of our uh, international or exported wines. So this wine is usually been performing really well into the export markets. It's a full body uh, style of uh, Chardonnay. Uh, we call it a JCB number 47. I will explain to you more details in the next slide when we come onto this portfolio of wines. Secondly, we have the Blanc Cuvier Group, which is about 80% of Chenin Blanc and 20% of Muller Turgau. Muller Turgau is a, is a local grape from Germany, which has been added uh, to give you a nice acidity and aromatics to the wine. Now, when I said about Chenin Blanc, so this wine works really well with many of those hot dishes we produce, we make in India. Uh, this pairs really well with those dishes. Simply you want to open a bottle of sparkling for brunches, uh, you socialize with your friends, or, or, in, or a late, lazy evening, you want to just open a glass of sparkling. This wine is a, is a really good wine to do so. It's a light and a fruity with lots of primary uh, fresh fruits onto the palate. Uh, the aging for this one, this wine has been done uh, second fermentation for about 12 to 14 months in the bottle. And like this one spends about 30 months of second fermentation in the bottle. This spends about 12 to 14 months. So uh, a young, fruity and an exuberant, beautiful wine uh, to, to drink. That's the difference between our Blanc Cuvée Brut and the JCB number 47. Now when it's, when it's come to drinking the wine, there are, there are different temperature ranges we suggest. Uh, you shouldn't be just suggesting a one temperature because it's difficult to maintain or to serve the wine at that temperature. You can obviously have ups and downs when you, when you are serving the temperature, serving the wines, especially in India. So when you serve sparkling wines, for example, you have to uh, a range of temperatures. The whites, the light wines should be served at about slightly chiller, about five to six. So the Grand Cuvée Brut can be served at about five to six. And the, the JCB, which is a full body, can be served about 9 to 10 degrees Celsius. Now this principle is applicable for all the wines of different styles. So for your whites when you come, your Pinot Gris, your Sauvignon Blanc and your Rieslings can be served at about 7 to 8 and your fuller bodies like your Chardonnay and Vionier or Southern Rome whites can be served at about 13 to 14 degrees Celsius. Same for the reds, when you are, when you are trying, when you are opening your reds, your lighter wines like your Sangiovese or the one R Sangiovese, or the Pinot Noir, the Beaujolais, the Valpolicella, or even some, some Merlot can be served at about 17 to 18, while uh, your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Shiraz, uh, Arsete, uh, non, uh, the Super Tuscans, the Napa, they can be served at about 21, 20 degrees Celsius. That's the, the range of temperatures you should uh, look into while, while, while serving the, the wines. So uh, taste the wines. This makes more applicable when you're actually uh, we are actually doing a physical tastings, but however, we will try to get you as, as close associations with this uh, element of tastings. So when you taste the wines, you have to, the, there are three major factors. First is the appearance, which we call it as a C. So when you see the wine, you have to, uh, you have to fill the glass for about 30, 30 ml or about 45 ml. You tilt the glass away from yourself at a 45 degree angle against a white background and you look at the center of the wine. When you look at the center of the wine, you have to look at the intensity of the color. The color should be either light, it should be either medium, or it should be either dark. That's the intensity of the color you identify. And when you identify that color, you will come to know there are a lot of, uh, lot of hints which you can acquire just by identifying the color. So next is your smell. When you smell the wine, you need to swirl the glass. The reason we swirl the glass so you disturb the molecules which are resting in the glass. When the molecules get disturbed, they interact with each other, they collide with each other, and they start to come out of the glass. At this moment, you have to put your nose into the glass so you can extract a maximum aroma, maximum bouquet from the wine. This bouquet is really important for you to analyze what the wine is going to be when you taste the wine afterwards, right? 90% of the time, what you smell is also going to be what you taste. Now, when you do uh, go to the tastings, uh, you have to taste in multiple sips. You cannot just have one sip and then you can understand the wine. It is not possible. So you have to taste multiple sips. So then every sip, you identify some of the other factors. There are many factors which you need to identify. The first and the most important is your 
uh, your primary fruit flavors, which you have already got some idea when you have smell. Now you have to taste the wine so you understand in detail what are the primary fruits you should be expecting. Secondly, you have to look for the acidity. Is it going to be a low, a medium, or a high acidity? If it's good, and the body, if it's going to be a light body, a medium body, or a full body. You also have to identify the structure of the wine and the alcohol percentage of the wine. Is it the alcohol going to be a, a low, a medium, or a high? And if it's a red wine, you also identify the tannins. Are the tannins going to be low, medium, or high? Now, these are the factors you have to identify, and it's not possible to, to get all those factors in one tasting. So you take multiple sips, and then you analyze one or two factors in one tasting, and then you take another sip, and you go on and on and on till you are 100% satisfied that yes, you have completed the tasting now. Once you have done that, you have straight away need to write down into a diary or a book. You maintain a tasting book. It's a good reference point for you to understand how the wine has performed uh, on, on the scale of appearance, nose, and uh, tastings. This is a uh, this is a good reference point for you to also understand the quality of the wine against the price which has been offered. So if the price is really low and you have seen the quality of the wine is really good, then yes, it's a great quality wine uh, at this price. But if you see the wine price is really expensive and you're still not happy with the quality, then you understand this is this is not this is not a good wine. I mean. It could have been better or you know the price would have been slightly lower yes then we can think about this uh, or you can advise this wine to others that is the reason why we do the tastings and secondly also for you to understand how the wine has been performed in a particular vintage for example if you have tried the wine in 2018 uh, and, and and you have got certain idea about how the wine is which you have already got into your tasting sheets now when you try a wine in future uh, next year and then you when you taste the wine you have got your tasting notes, do you understand what's the difference in both the wines? You you could say, oh, the wine which was produced in 2018 was a spectacular wine, while the wine which you produced next year is not so great because there are certain elements which are missing uh, in, 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 the, in the 2021 vintage, uh, or you know, that is the kind of assumptions we have to do when we, when we do the tastings. So that's, that's about how to taste wines. Uh, wine storages. Store wine at a stable temperature of about about 20-25 degrees Celsius. Store wine bottles horizontally. Uh, either they are screw cap or they are crop. Uh, does not matter. You, you you store them horizontally. Protect from light and vibration. Light is really important. Uh, three hours of direct sunlight ultraviolet rays in the bottle of wine can damage the wine completely. Vibration is uh, not good for those wines which are meant to age, and there are only 5% of the wines in the entire world which can actually uh, benefit from aging. So many of the wines which we receive in India or which we drink in India are not meant for aging. So for those wines, vibration does not make much sense. Store wine at a proper humidity level, which is mostly available at many of the places or even at your home. If possible, store wine in a cabinet. This is only uh, good for when you are collecting wines, when you are a lover and habit collector of fine wines, then yes, you need to store them in a wine cabinet. And if not, then you can always keep the wine at one end of the corner, where you have a, a, a least a minimum interaction and, and, and you don't visit that often. So uh, uh, it needs to be invested in, in a silent, in a quiet place, but obviously away from sunlight as well. Uh, once you have opened the bottle of wine, then we suggest you to, to consume them within seven days of period. Uh, the idea we say seven days is because the bacteria does not multiply while it's in the fridge. As soon as the bottle has been out, uh, it, it's a, it starts to perish and the bacteria multiply and the wine will get uh, off really quickly. After seven days of time, you will still uh, you can still drink the wine, but it will not give you that maximum pleasure uh, which you could have found it when you had opened the bottle of the wine. So that's the reason why uh, we say you, you can drink it, but yes, you don't expect uh, the similar kind of the flavor and the the enhancement of the enjoyment, uh, the wine which has been uh, served after a few days. That's that's a, a simple reason of uh, of opening the wine. Food and wine pairing, really critical and important subject. Uh, especially, you need to follow the principles uh, of the food uh, with the wine. When you do that, you create a really uh, well harmonized effect. Now, there are certain foods uh, which you all know 
has certain amount of uh, element which is overpowering into it. So you need to identify those overpowering uh, elements and that needs to be paired with the correct wine. Like many of your uh, many of your food items will have a lot of salt into it. For example, salted nuts, salted uh, uh, salted dry fruits, uh, salted fish as well, uh, salted cheese as well. Many of the times these are being served uh, as it is. And when you do have those salted food with you, you need to pair wines which are high in tannic, high in body, and high in alcohol. When you do that, when you do that, uh, your tannic wines become less tannic. Your body and the alcohol of the wine feels less to you when you pair with a salty food. And what happens to the food? The food becomes becomes normal as well. The saltiness in, in the food uh, gets eliminated, and you create a beautiful pairing of, uh, of the food and the wine. Right, so that's how uh, the pairing works. Same way when you have the acidic food, when you have a food which has a lot of uh, uh, tomatoes, which is naturally acidic, or some balsamic vinegar, or if you put some uh, dressings of fresh lemon juice and lime juice, then you are increasing the acidity in the food. Then you need to make sure that you don't have your wines with too much of acidity. When you have too much of acidity, you're creating a lot of acidity onto your palate, which is not good. You will actually have a lot of sharpness and tartness into your mouth which will not be a pleasing effect so you think about the wines which has less acidity and when you when you pair that your your wines would be more fruitier and sweeter to be more richer and your acidity will be well balanced with the food so you're creating a, a really well uh, a great pairing with the, with the acidity and the food same way with the sweet a, a very good example would be something like your gulab jamun which you all know how the gulab jamun tastes like it is really really sweet and even the uh, the, the the juice of the gulab jamun is, is quite sweet now when you're doing a pairing with a wine which is less sweet uh, something like uh, an off dry wine which does not have that amount of sweetness imagine when you have a piece of the gulab jamun and now you taste the wine your wine will be feeble and thin it will be uh, it will be a really really uh, you will not even taste anything in the wine. You, what you will taste is all about gulab jamun in your mouth. So you need to match the weight of the sweetness with the sweetness in the wine, which has to be equal. So either you pair something which is less sweet, uh, like uh, like a fresh fruit salad with some meringue and some uh, and some strawberry coulis, or, or maybe you want to pair something like a uh, like a creme caramel or a creme brulee, which has a less amount of sweetness, which can be equal to the off dryness in the wine. With that, you are actually creating, uh, you're keeping the body, uh, the, the weight of the sweetness at the same level. And, and that's how you need to think about doing the, the pairing. That's how uh, the sweetness works in the wine, in the food. Savory or umami is, is one of the, the factors which is still not being understood by, by many people. Uh, savory and umami is being found in many food items, usually like asparagus, uh, tomatoes, mushrooms, some overripe cheeses and some salted and cured meats as well. Uh, Chinese and Japanese cuisines, they use a lot of umami and uh, MSG, which is a monosodium glutamate. You take a pinch of it and you dissolve in water. You try to taste that water. That is what umami is all about. Uh, a very good example is pick up a mushroom and then without any seasoning of salt and pepper, you put that mushroom into the microwave and then you taste that mushroom the metallic taste which gives to you is all about umami. It's very difficult to pair a wine with which has an umami taste. Uh, so hence, you should take care when pairing wines which have a high levels of tannins and character, oak character. You should not pair wines which has a lot of tannins and oak character. It will simply give you a more drying and more bitter. It will give you a lot of acidity. Uh, it will not work really well. So try to pair wines which has less umami, something like a Fratelli Sangiovese or Pinot Noir or a uh, uh, a Beaujolais or a Merlot style of wines. This can be a great uh, options uh, when you are looking for pairing umami foods. Next is your fatty and oily. When you have a lot of fat and when you have a lot of oily foods, uh, great examples is your uh, your fried chicken from your Burger King or from your KFC. When you have those fried foods and when you're pairing a highly acidic wines, when I think about acidic, acidic wines, there's one thing which I always remember is about champagnes and sparkling wines. They have the highest amount of acidity. When you pair a highly acidic wine, that, that acidity, that sharpness in the acidity 
will cut off the fattiness and the oiliness in the food. You have a piece of the fried chicken and then you drink, uh, have a drink of uh, sparkling wine. It will clean your palate, it will neutralize your palate, it will take off all the, the off flavors of the oiliness and your palate will be clean and neutral. That's how you create uh, that, that really well balanced uh, the food and wine pairing. That is the only wine which can clean off your fattiness and the oiliness, a wine which is high acidic and you will enjoy uh, the next food or the next wine to come after that. That's that's how you do, do that. Hot and chili food, I've already given you examples. When you're looking at hot foods, sweet foods, which is a lot of uh, hot, you try to do uh, wines which are low in alcohol and slightly sweetness in them. Sweetness balances the hotness. The wines will be dry. There will be no sweetness after that. And the other hotness will be low. You will not feel the food that hot. That's your perfect pairing you're trying to create. Imagine when you have a slightly higher alcohol, what happens? Alcohol accentuates the, 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 the hotness in the dish. That means uh, the hot food will be more hot and the alcohol you will have a burning sensation when you, when, you, when you drink a wine. So that's the reason why you should avoid wines with high alcohol and you're trying with hot food. Right, uh, next example is your highly flavored foods. When you have highly flavored food, think about uh, something like a, a goat cheese salad. A goat cheese salad is a classic pairing with a Sauvignon Blanc. Simply because Sauvignon Blanc again has a lot of acidity and the goat cheese salad also is fatty. So the acidity uh, cuts off the fattiness and the flavor of the, uh, and the aromatics of the Sauvignon Blanc is in par at the same level as the aromatics of the goat cheese salad. So you're looking at the body, you're looking at the flavor and you're looking at the fattiness. They are all been perfectly matched with the wine. So that's how you have to look at and, and match the flavor, the right amount of flavor in the wine and the food. So that's the principles of the food and wine pairing. You need to understand and that's how then you can apply those principles uh, to any food or any, uh, any wine on that. So that's uh, the, the food and wine pairing. Right, so next is your careers in wine. So there are uh, three different careers which I have identified. First one is your WSET. WSET is also known as Wines and Spirits Education Trust. There are different levels starting from level one to level two uh, until you reach level five, which is one of the toughest uh, exams in the world. Level one is been exempted for people who are graduating from the hotel management colleges. You can straight away enroll for WSET level two. Uh, which is the the most uh, uh, which is the most uh, most number of courses being taken uh, across the, the world. So level two in, in India, if you give them, it will cost you about twenty eight thousand rupees plus GST. This course happens em almost every other month, and many of the metro cities, these courses are been easily available. You can get easy access to these courses as well. So this requires at least about uh, two months of study self study. Uh, and then you need to appear for the exams. So you have to visit to the center where there will be a there will be a tutor who will teach you uh, uh, a more detailed explanation of the course. Where you will have about four to five days of, of lectures, and on the fifth day or the sixth day, day uh, you will usually have to give the exams. The passing marks for the exams is about fifty five percent, and the choice of questions is mostly about multiple choice and a short short notes. So combining both of them, you have to secure at least 55% to pass the course. WSET level two is also a stepping stone if you do wish to pursue WSET level three. So that will cost you somewhat about 1,10,000 or 15,000 plus GST. It's a much detailed course and we suggest you at least have six months of prior self-study before you enroll for the exams. Quota Master Similar is something similar to WSET. Uh, and uh, they both have the same topics covered, which I will explain to you now. Uh, the Court of Master Similar has also been done in India. Recently, it has been started, and this happens almost once every year. Uh, for the fees, it's about 50,000 rupees plus GST for the Court of Master Similar level one. So the CMS level one is equivalent to WSET level two. The CMS level two is equivalent to WSET level three. So in total, there are four levels in CMS, right? So the topics you covered uh, in both WCT and the Court of Master Similar would be in more detail about the food and wine pairing, the art of tasting wines, the wine production techniques, the maturation and the storage of wines, uh, 
the classic regions for the wines, uh, the, the, the most important white and the red grape varieties, uh, the production methods of the, the, the white, red, rosé, uh, sparkling wines and fortified wines. Uh, we'll, also be, uh, we'll also be covering more topics on, on, on beers and, and other beverages, but the primarily more important is your wines. So, so this is more or less uh, the two courses which, which are really important if you want to advance professionally into the wine world. The third one is the Wine Scholar Guild. Uh, this is an online exam where you don't have to go anywhere. You just have to study on your own. And whenever you're ready, even after a week or after a year, you can, you can give this course at your own pace. You have to visit your nearest center where you, you will be given the exams online. Uh, this is a, a more a fun and an exciting way of knowing the subject. Uh, ideally suited for people who have been drinking wine for quite some time and they would like to know more about the wines. The courses have been, have been specifically targeted for particular countries. Like if you would like to know more about uh, uh, French wines or if you would like to know about Italian or Spanish wines, then they have courses like French Wine Scholar, Italian Wine Scholar and, and, and Spanish Wine Scholar. So this, these are the courses which have been offered by the Wine Scholar. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's about the courses. And next we have the, the career opportunities. The seminar is one of the most uh, important uh, role, the aspect you are looking at if you want to do, uh, if you want to work with the hotels and restaurants. So the seminar would be the one who would be responsible uh, for, for creating uh, the food and wine pairing, uh, very strongly liaising with the chefs to understand the recipes and accordingly suggesting to your diners uh, the correct wine uh, as per their needs. So you need to understand, have a good understanding of the food dishes as well so that you can recommend uh, the wines as well. You will also be responsible for purchasing and buying of the wines, or picking up the wines from your back area and, and stacking them in your cellars. Uh, you will be also be uh, looking after the training and development plans for the key FMB staffs and, and you will be also responsible for inventory and, and, uh, and, and changing the wine menus quite often. Uh, many of the times you will also be doing uh, events, promotions and wine dinners uh, for, for generating uh, revenues for the for the so that's the, that's the more or less uh, job of a sommelier. Wine sales executive is when you are working for a particular importer or distributor responsible for selling a certain uh, certain set of the wines which uh, the importer or the distributor has. Along with that, you'll be also uh, uh, giving more information and knowledge about those wines, and you'll be doing the tastings, uh, tastings and trainings uh, to the hotels and restaurants uh, on your wines. The brand ambassador is majorly associated with bigger brands like DIJ, Formulita, and Bacardi, where you will be responsible uh, for one particular brand in their, in their portfolio. So you will be assigned a one, one region or one sub region where you will be dealing with, uh, with, with the, the, the selling, the sales, uh, with the advocacy, with the education, with the events, uh, with the promotions. So everything which is associated with the brand. To increase the sales, you will be responsible for that brand. Wine consultant is something like uh, you're working at a at your own pace. You're working at your uh, a freelancer. Uh, maybe you are you are doing your consultations for small restaurants and bars. Uh, probably they would not looking to hire a full time sommelier, but you are somewhat providing the similar kind of the services. You are designing the the, the wine list for them. Uh, you are you are training the food and beverage staffs. And you're also purchasing and buying your wines for them. Right. So, wine writer or blogger is something where, where you are uh, looking to do uh, providing articles and blogs online. You're providing social media content to many, uh, many social media uh, uh, channels, or you're also uh, creating and writing articles offline for many of the wine centric magazines. So, so that's uh, the role of the, the blogger. Uh, you will be required to provide the content. It can be every other day, or weekly, or bi-weekly, or maybe a monthly if you are publishing articles offline as well. Wine marketing is something which is uh, associated when you do have a, 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 when you do have a background or a foundation course into the marketing. Along with that, you have also completed the WSET level two. Then that can actually help you uh, uh, in the role of the wine marketing where you can work for a particular set of hotels or you can independently provide your services uh, as, as a consultant to many places uh, in the role in the capacity of, the, of an advertising or as a, as a wine marketer. That's uh, the more or less of the, the, 
the job opportunities related with the body industry. So some of the facts uh, we would like to show you about our company. Uh, we have the highest growth rate in the Indian wine industry, one of India's highest awarded wine companies. Uh, we have laid down a new benchmark in terms of quality for Indian wines worldwide. We have 29 different labels of domestic wines. We are present in 18 Indian states and nine countries. We are present at 11,000 touch point of sales. Now the grape Sangiovese, which I have already discussed with you, it's a native grape to Italy, to Tuscany, responsible for many famous line, wines like Chianti. We have bought that grape back into our Indian, Indian uh, terroir in Akrut, and we have planted many different expressions of wines from, from this grape variety. Some of the examples what we have, or some of the styles which we have producing are over here. So uh, the first one is the Fratelli the Sangiovese Bianco. The Bianco means white. This is a, a white wine which has been produced from a red grape, a Sangiovese. Next, we have uh, uh, the first and the only uh, white wine which has been produced from red grape in India. Uh, Sangiovese Rosé, 100% uh, Sangiovese Rosé produced from uh, a red grape, India's first and the only Sangiovese Rosé. A Fratelli Sangiovese, which I have mentioned to you many times, uh, a light and fruity, easy drinking wine, a great connect with the Chianti style wines, which are imported into India. If you want to uh, replace them, this is a beautiful wine, you could suggest them too. MS Red, which is a ma master's selection portfolio, I'm going to explain to you later. Now, this is also a, a really great, great, affordable wine at a, at a good quality price ratio. And last, we have a Sete, uh, which is a, a benchmark of flagship wine. Again, all of these grape varieties are being produced from one single grape variety in San Giovese, and sometimes they are even blended with other grape varieties. But the idea here to showcase is what our winemakers have achieved, the skills they have acquired, those those skills have been implemented into our winemaking techniques, and hence we are able to craft so many different expressions of those wines. So international collaborations, the MS, which is our master's selection between Piero Masi, our chief winemaker, and Stephen Spurrier, who is uh, uh, the editor consultant for Decanter Magazine. Together, uh, they met and they created uh, something different, a unique set of wines from grape varieties which have never been experienced in India before. Simply put this way, uh, this is uh, some of the India's uh, the first project which we have made. The MS Rosé is 100% Sangiovese. The MS White and MS Red are again made from grape varieties which have never been produced before. We, were, we do about 6,000 bottles of the Rosé and 13,000 bottles of the Red and White. Next is the Janoon. Janoon means passion in the Indian language and this is a passion of two people. Kapil Sekri, the man on the left responsible uh, for, for one of the founders of our company and Jean Charles Boise, he's uh, the proprietary of Boise Collection, who also has wines in, in Burgundy, California, England, and their latest venture in India in 2016. Uh, the, the idea was to produce the finest wines from the Indian terroir, uh, super luxury of fine wines. Uh, this became true in 2016 when we introduced uh, 2,400 bottles of the red, white, and sparklings. The JCB number 47, which I had already explained to you initially. Now, uh, number 47 is because we got the independence in 1947, and JCB is a short form of Jean Charles Boise. So, a tribute to India and France, we have created this label of JCB number 47. The white is a blend of about 60% Chardonnay, 40% Sauvignon, and the red is a proprietary of pure Bordeaux blend. Both the white and the red have been aged for about 24 months in the French oak barrels, and for another three months of bottle aging. That gives you the more complexity and uh, stability in the wine. These wines are simply been made for the export markets because these wines compete against many of our international wines. Having said that, we still have listings of some of these wines in, in many of the super luxury resorts and hotels where we do sell these wines. These wines are priced at about 2500 for the white, 3500 for the sparkling, and 4500 for the red. It's more or less the MRP for these wines. Some of the prestigious listings where we are placed and we work really, really closely are in India, USA, and UK, where many of the Michelin star restaurants and some standalone restaurants where Sete is also been served by Plus. Some of the awards and recognitions we have received for Janoon are the wine enthusiast, the SWV, and the decanter. And now is the story for the Sete. Sete means seven in the Italian language. Six are the people of the, of the company who formed 
and, and seventh person is the man himself, Piero Masi, the chief winemaker. So together they formed Sete. This became true in 2009 when we received a really exceptional harvest, a really great amount of fruit which was separated and then fermented and aged uh, differently. We then produced an uh, important about 19,000 bottles. The bottles have been named as Sete and that's how the story came into existence. Uh, since then we were able to produce Sete almost every year. Our current production sits for about 80,000 bottles. Simply because the demand for this wine not only came from India, but also from our uh, export market. This wine has been made from a blend of 60% Sangiovese and 40% Cabernet Sauvignon, sourced from 1% of the entire vineyard production. One of 1% of the best grapes have been used to produce sete. The wine has been aged for about 12 to 14 months in the French and the American oak barrels, and for another three months of bottle aging to enhance the, the tertiary characteristics in the wine. For your, for your information, uh, a French barrel would cost you somewhere about $800 to $3,500 and an American barrel would cost you somewhere about $500 to $600. That's the cost of the barrel which also uh, impacts to the, to the cost of the wine and hence uh, the bottle of sete is priced at about $2,100 more or less in uh, major states. For the sete to be paired, we really simply need a, a dish or a meat uh, which has a lot of fat and proteins. Proteins is essentially required to cut off the tannins in the wine, and this wine has been loaded with lots of tannins. Uh, the tannin works beautifully well, and you create a wine which can which can pair really well at the similar intensity, concentration, and a flavor profile of the meat. So that's how sate is been paired with, with many of the meats. Well, that's uh, our sate. Uh, next is our cans. So cans is something which we uh, introduced uh, last year in January, uh, in, in March, uh, simply because the, 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 the production and the acceptance of the cans has been accepted really, really well. Many of the countries where the cans was introduced in 2015 and 16 were simply because majority of the wines have been supposed to be drunk at their youngest. Like, like I said, 95% of the wines are need to be consumed uh, when they are young. And, and, and that's how the can, cans came into popularity. Because especially in India, when we have a lot of uh, challenges uh, with the storage of the wine and the wine gets off and oxidized, uh, the cans works beautifully well because you have been exempted from from uh, from from those uh, off flavors which you cannot which you can find in the wine. So cans works beautifully well for those reasons, and hence today we are going to show you what are the USPs and the benefits the can has against the bottles. So uh, our version of the can we call as tilt, and we simply say at chill it, open it, and sip it. It's a crisp, easy, and a delicious product. Some of the USPs of our can, it's the first of its kind in India to produce the four different uh, the, the variations. The goodness of wine absolutely now available in a can. You don't need any wine glasses, nor do you need any wine opener. It's a vegan and gluten-free product. We don't use any animal products to process the wine in a can. It's so easy to carry and store a very convenient product. It does not have any expiry. Uh, it's a first and quality coverage product, which has been canned, which does not have an expiry. 11% alcohol makes a place for, a, for, for those occasions during the lunch and afternoon places where bottles are sometimes been restricted to carry. You can use them at pool bar, at beaches, uh, at, at, at picnics or outdoor caterings as well. Light and air is usually the enemy for the wines. But in this case, it has been shielded away because cans have a layer of aluminium which, which reflects the light and air away from it. While in the bottles, if you keep them for three hours in open sunlight, the wines get completely damaged and a slow oxidation where your wines do not move, the, the, the wines get oxidized and it's completely finished. But in the case of the cans, you have the benefit and you can keep the cans for about six months in a year and it will be absolutely fine and fresh at all the times. It's easy to dispose. You can just dispose of like any other soft beverage. You can just brush it off. Quick chilling is one of the great USPs. The wine can chill for about uh, five degrees Celsius and about 15 minutes, in less than 15 minutes, while, while the bottles can take about more than an hour to bring you at the same temperature. A portion control, I think 250 ml is a great portion size for many average consumers to finish easily a one, uh, one can of tilt. The carbon emissions which have been generated uh, from the can are, are far lesser compared to plastic and the glass. 
the cans are 100% recyclable, uh, which is not in the case of plastic and glass. So the cans are a much preferred environmentally friendly product, and the cans contains about 150 calories, which is less than many of your beers and freezers, which which clocks at about 225 calories. The, the four versions we have today are the bubbly fruit and the rosé, which are the extreme life left and right. So they are good replacements for, for someone who is looking for a sparkling wine, who looks for effervescence and gas in their wine or the drink. This is a good replacement for them. And the white and the red in the middle are great replacements for someone who loves to have the still white and the reds. So that's that's uh, uh, the cancer. The cans are priced at about 175 rupees, more or less in your state. And, and, and they have been suggested to serve at about five degrees Celsius, irrespective of the color or the texture in them. Noe is something which we have uh, introduced on the same lines as the, as the tilt. Uh, it simply means uh, like you can just serve it, uh, chill it, open it, and have a sip of it. We also have the spritzer version in, in, the, in the Noe. The spritzer means 50% uh, of wine and 50% of, of sparkling water with just a splash of sugar. So you can either have Noe as a tilt, uh, the similar way, or even you can put it in a white wine glass, put some cubes of ice, tap some fresh mint and slice of lemon, and there you go, pour the contents of the Noe into the glass. You can immediately create a classic cocktail for yourself, or, or, or you can just sip it from the can itself. It, 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 uh, it enjoys the same benefits as the tilt. It, in fact, it has 8% alcohol, which is a perfect beverage partner during the lunches where you want to keep low on alcohol, you don't want to consume a lot of those alcohol, then the Noe works perfectly well. It is. It has about 120 calories, which is quite light and refreshing onto your palate. So you simply want to have, uh, not too heavy onto, uh, to drink something, then the Noe is, is a perfectly well uh, made beverage. A very affordable and a beautiful packing, very economically priced as well. And this is about 150 rupees for about 250 ml can, which is a perfect uh, economical product uh, at this price. A great drink for summers, uh, or, or you just want to have a simple drink without much complexity. And last, we have the cheese. The cheese is something which we introduced this year in January. The idea for the cheese was because we've been producing wines for quite some time, we now want to do well into the, the cheese, but we want to have the essence of the wines into it. So the cheeses were inspired from our vineyards. Uh, these have been handcrafted because we don't produce in bulk and these are the preservatives free. We don't add any kind of preservatives because when you do add preservatives, you, uh, uh, you compromise with the quality of the cheeses. Uh, and hence the, the cheeses rest on three principles, vineyard inspired, handcrafted and preservative free. We have worked together with Kasi, who are the, the craft producers of cheeses from Chennai. Together with them, we are now able to get three different uh, types of the cheeses. They are the Sanjeevisi leafed aged cheddar. Sanjeevisi is one of the most important wine in our portfolio, and, and, and now we have used the leaves of the Sanjeevisi. We have picked up the Sanjeevisi leaves and then we have wrapped them around our cheddar cheese. When we wrap around the cheddar cheese, we leave them to age in our cellar for about five months. After five months of aging, when you remove the, the cheese, this is how it looks. You get those, those uh, dried Sanjeevisi wine leaves, which are the edible one. Uh, this that imparts you the savory and the smoky flavors. Along with that, you have this this cheddar G, which provides you the rich and the buttery notes. The richness and the, the smokiness, which pairs and intermingles really well into each other, creates you a, a really great a, a taste profile onto your palate. That's the Sanjeevisi leaf aged cheddar. Second, we have the Chenin rinsed sunburst. Here we are using the actual Chenin blanc wine. Now, uh, there's a process in cheese making where the cheese needs to be washed with water. In this case, we wash the cheese with Chenin Blanc wine. When the cheese has been washed with the wine, the flavor and the color seeps into the cheese. When the color seeps into it, you get a slightly bright orangey color. And when the flavor goes into the cheese, you get this sticky orange wine at the, at the corners. This is what's been provided by the Chenin Blanc. And the last one here, we have the Syrah Rinse Gusto. Here, the Chenin Blanc has been replaced with Syrah. Syrah provides uh, the texture, the characteristics of the spice and the black pepper corn. So when you have a bite of the, the Gusto, it will welcome you with the pronounced aromatics, uh, the flavors of the black pepper corn, which gives you a quite lingering and a beautiful finish at the end. And this is how all the three cheeses are been different from each other. However, they are all been made from cow's milk, but they have a different texture, a different flavor, 
in a different style altogether with a different essence of wine in each of them. So more information on these cheeses can be available on our website, which is afratelywines.in, and the cheeses have been, uh, have been, you can even buy the cheeses online. So some of the achievements uh, we have received, uh, these are just something I'd like to share with you. Uh, and then we also, uh, what the world says about us, especially the important critics uh, from the wine world, they have all praised and, and, and talked about our wines. Some of the media coverages we have received extensively, especially from India and, and some of them uh, from uh, abroad as well. That's that's uh, all about uh, the today's presentation. Well, well, that's all from me, guys. Uh, now that if you do have any questions, uh, I would like to ask you. Stop sharing. Yeah. I like it, so, sir. It was quite a, a lengthy session. I think we almost uh, took about 80 minutes. No problem, sir. Sir, like some of our viewers, they have a few questions. So okay. can we go through? So Where they are they ask, like, see the questions, yeah. sir? Yeah, they ask like in terms of quality, where does Indian wine stand? With respect to the old world region, we need to excuse me. You need to understand uh, the old world uh, falls in a different latitude uh, on the equator, which is between the thirty and the fifty. <clears throat> Whereas we don't fall in that equator, we are slightly away. Having said that, those wines, uh, most of the wines which have been produced, uh, do certainly have uh, the potential to age. Many of our wines, because a lot of the alcohol and the sugar we have been generated. Uh, and somewhat less acidity, we may not be able to express those wines and and, and compare ourselves to the, to the old world wines. However, though we are still young in the wine world, we are not that old, so we need uh, some more time uh, to actually be in a, in a competition with the, with the new world wines. So we are not there yet, but we are still advancing uh, yeah, and, 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 and making some really good wines, but we will still need at least five to ten years more uh, to be at the same level of them. Uh, so like, what are the points to remember while choosing a good wine? Well, uh, um, like I said, most of the wines have been, have been suggested to drink uh, at the earliest. So the first and the most important thing is you have to look at the vintage. Uh, the vintage of the wine should be in, in the next, in the last two years. If you are in 2020 or 2021, then you look, go back to two years back and that's the, the best point you should be having it because those will be at the optimum uh, and, and, the, and the maximum uh, flavor. Uh, anything beyond that, then you expect the wine to come down. So so, so try to see something uh, which, which you can pick up those wines. Secondly, uh, look at single grape varietals as well, uh, especially Chenin Blanc. I think it's one of the great wines we are producing. So look out for the expressions of Chenin Blanc, uh, especially if you are looking to pair with Indian food. This can be a really fantastic wine as well. So, is it necessary to blend white wines? It is not necessary to blend white wines. Uh, wines have been blended uh, so that you can have uh, a good quality of wine, or maybe sometimes it's the intention of the wine to produce a wine which is not available in the market. That's the, the reason why blends have been created. Uh, sometimes, uh, many of the times, the blends there are white wines. Many of them are single, uh, single grape varieties, but uh, there are very few wines which are blended in the white wines. Uh, that usually does not happen uh, with the white wines. But yes, you will see the reason why we do blends is because so that we can hide the faults of, of, of different grape varieties. That's why uh, blending is being done. So, Next, we have like, is wine good for health? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Wine is good for health if you take it in moderation. If you if you take it, uh, uh, if you do not exceed the limits, uh, I think one glass, uh, one glass with your meal or one glass with, one with your uh, before your meal uh, is a, is a good consumption uh, to have at least three to four times in a day uh, in a in a week. Sorry, that's a, a good thing. So next you are asking like what are tannins? So tannins are something which you have uh, understand simply uh, put in, a, in this place when you have uh, a black tea, when you brew the black tea and, and then you taste uh, the, the black tea which is brewed. So the more you brew the black tea, the, uh, 
the more you will have the tannins in the, in the tea. So tannin usually comes from the skin of the tea leaves or the skin of the grapes. Uh, right. So uh, it will give you the, the pulling sensation in the gums or at the forefront of your in your mouth. So the pulling sensation or the dryness which gives to you onto your onto your palate is being uh, defined as tannin. Imagine you have a black tea which is been brewed for five minutes. You will have a lot of extraction of tannins from the leaf. And when you drink that tea, you will have that pulling and that extraction feeling uh, which you can see in your, in your gums. This is exactly what tannin does in red wines as well. Thank you, Mr. Rakesh, for giving us deep knowledge about the wines. I would like my colleague, Mr. Indranil, to end the webinar with the vote of thanks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rakesh. We appreciate you being here in spite of your busy schedule. This session was very informative and wonderful in a very simple way. Uh, I, Indranil Bose, on behalf of Bhikaji Kama Subharti College of Hotel Management, would like to thank Mr. Rakesh, today's speaker, Dr. Shimon Verma, Principal, BCSCHM, Mr. Vinay, Moderator and Assistant Professor, BCSCHM, and all the attendees who joined us today for this uh, training session. We assure you that this kind of trading session uh, will be organized in the near future also, as we have received enormous registration for this event. It, it was around 1500 plus registrations. So definitely we will see you next time and uh, be safe. Thank you. And Jai Hind. And one information I would like to give, uh, all the uh, attendees would get an e-certificate very soon. So be patient and be safe. Thank you. Jai Hind.